So everyone probably just heard that we are, uh, this meeting is being recorded. I uh, hope that's okay. I'll talk a little bit about that, more about that here uh, in a second. Um, so first off, thank you everyone for joining us for this introductory session uh, on the topic of inclusionary housing. Uh, following this introductory session, uh, Dr. Cog is forming a cohort or working group of interested local government staff seeking to collaborate uh, with peers from around the region to improve uh, their overall readiness for inclusionary housing ordinances. Uh, I will do some very quick kind of terminology check-ins uh, just so folks aren't, aren't confused. I would not be surprised if you hear uh, both myself and maybe our speakers today uh, use the terms inclusionary zoning or inclusionary housing interchangeably. Um, I, I think we do uh, intend to use them interchangeably, so I, I don't think we intend them to meet, have dramatically different uh, meanings. Um, you will also probably hear uh, myself or maybe other folks um, at Dr. Cog uh, also use the terms uh, work group or cohort uh, interchangeably for the process that will begin um, after today's uh, meeting. Uh, those meetings, again, are intended for local governments that want to do a deeper dive uh, on, on, the, on this topic uh, with obviously a goal of peer learning uh, and opportunities to share uh, experiences or approaches uh, in developing or uh, implementing ordinances and programs. So you may hear us use both work group and cohort for referring to the same thing. Uh, those aren't two different uh, series of, of meetings. Uh, Jeffrey, if you go to the next slide. Uh, with that quick um, uh, intro, uh, let me just sort of quickly orient you to our speakers and the, and the team. Uh, today, um, just quickly, maybe the Dr. Cog team, and then I'll, I'll, I'll mention the team that's that's on the slide in front of you. Uh, for those that I don't know, my name is Brad Calvert. Um, I am the director of the Regional Planning and Development Division uh, at Dr. Cog. Uh, I'm going to kick us off, uh, but also wrap us up a little bit later. Uh, good chance you will also hear from my colleague, uh, Joffrey Chiapella. Uh, Joffrey is a senior planner at Dr. Cog. He is sort of managing this overall project on the Dr. Cog end of things. Uh, uh, helping run the show today, and he's also handling a few pieces of today's program, uh, and so you'll hear from him a little bit later. Uh, also from the Dr. Cog team, uh, Kate Hale, Lisa Hood, and Andy Taylor are all helping out, uh, generally here to help support uh, the meeting, uh, monitoring the chat, uh, looking for technical issues or other items to follow up, uh, so feel free to uh, report any problems in the chat, and uh, some combination of Kate, Lisa, and Andy will work with you to get those uh, resolved. Um, as noted on the slide, uh, we do have three uh, fantastic uh, speakers uh, that we're going to hear from today. Uh, in order uh, on, the, on the slide is actually the order you will, will hear from them uh, as well. So Heidi uh, Agler is the managing director and founder of Root Policy Research. Uh, she's an expert in conducting housing market analyses, fair housing assessments, and housing strategic plans. Uh, and then next, Annalise Hoke uh, is a principal planner with the city and county of Denver. Uh, Annalise's work uh, focuses on regulatory changes uh, to advance and implement the city's adopted plans, uh, including initiatives to increase affordable housing and to create an equitable and inclusive uh, Denver. And then finally, uh, Kathy Bedler. Uh, Kathy is the housing and community investment manager for the city of Longmont and the Longmont Housing Authority. So you'll hear from all three of those uh, today. And then one wild card uh, speaker, which we, we uh, drafted uh, to to play a sort of role of standby, um, and that is Megan Dollar. Uh, Megan is with the Colorado Municipal League and she serves as their legislative advocacy manager. Uh, she may uh, uh, chime in if there are any questions that come forward that really are, 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 are oriented towards uh, the inclusionary housing legislation uh, signed by the governor recently, right? So Megan has been very involved uh, with that work. So we thought uh, we would free our speakers of having to be that subject matter expert and tap uh, another one uh, who could help out. Next slide, Joffrey. Um, I'll let you uh, orient yourself uh, to the agenda uh, based on what's on, on the slide. Um, just generally um, about how we're going to orient our time. We will have uh, very brief moments for questions and answers after each presentation, and then we'll have uh, some time uh, at the end uh, as well. Uh, notably, from a content perspective, we have not asked th this group of speakers to, to make the case uh, for increasing the availability of affordable housing uh, in the Denver region. Uh, and instead, they are jumping right into the topic of, at hand, um, inclusionary housing ordinances. Uh, today's discussion will include a very brief orientation to inclusionary housing. Uh, and you also hear the experiences from both Denver and Longmont who have developed multiple approaches uh, over the past two decades. So some folks that are very steeped um, in uh, this tool. Um, hopefully many of you uh, on the call today are, are here because your experience 
uh, planning with your community uh, has re revealed some or all of the following statements uh, warrant, warrant our collective attention. Uh, hence, not really spending a lot of time on case making. I think we can hopefully uh, mostly agree with this notion that Colorado is in the midst of an affordable housing uh, crisis and our workforce can no longer afford to live in communities where they are employed or in their community, their community of choice. Uh, we also know that a majority of households in the region uh, that earn less than the, the area median income uh, for the region are cost burdened. Uh, we've also recognized that all segments uh, of the for sale housing market have seen dramatic increases in, in price uh, over the past decade, uh, but in, in many respects, uh, the increases in the lower priced uh, units have outpaced increases in the, the mid and upper tier uh, units. And finally, I, I think we can all agree that the, 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 the reality is that the pipeline of affordable units uh, in our region is not sufficient to meet current and future demand for attainable and affordable housing uh, in the Denver region. Uh, so finally, a few other quick uh, notes to orient everyone to today's uh, meeting. As you, if you were on right as we started, we are recording uh, today. Um, that is in part because given the amount of background information uh, that will be important for a future series of meetings, we thought it important uh, to go ahead and record this. I, I heard from one uh, community right before we started that they were not able to make it. So glad we will have this recording uh, for them to review uh, later. Uh, also, we will be using uh, Mentimeter uh, throughout today's session. Um, hopefully, this is a tool that you've used or seen. Uh, we will use Mentimeter uh, to, to host a few polling questions that we'll launch here in a second. Uh, additionally, when we get to that Q&A portion of the agenda with our speakers, we would love to use Mentimeter uh, so that for you to submit uh, any questions that you have for each speaker. Uh, in part, we're doing that so that the speakers can see all the questions that are coming in and kind of have a sense of, of how they want to organize uh, a response uh, to the questions that they can get to. It also allows you to submit questions uh, anonymously. So we thought that was a good tool to use here. But as with all Zoom meetings, please feel free to use the chat uh, to let us know if you're experiencing technical difficulties or if there are any other sort of general observations that you want to share with the, with attendees. We will make sure and, and, and keep this log and determine what follow-ups might be needed uh, after today's meeting. Um, so here in a second, I'll turn it over uh, to Joffrey to sort of kick off the, the polling uh, part of, of uh, today's conversation. Um, it's pretty straightforward. If you haven't used uh, Minty, you can join at minty.com uh, using your browser or device of choice. Uh, I typically join via my cell phone, my smartphone, and I will do that again today. In part, I do it just to keep my sort of tasks and windows uh, separate, but you could join um, uh, using your uh, computer uh, as well. And when you've navigated to minty.com, uh, you'll be prompted for code. Um, that code for today's meeting is 84621995. Um, please don't feel like you had to write that down. It's gonna be present on all of the slides, but I know people really like to jump in uh, sometimes. So you should be able to use that and, and enter um, whenever you uh, see a, a poll, polling site that you'd like to respond to. And then I would just, before turning it over to Joffrey, um, everyone, if you want to use the chat to introduce yourselves, uh, feel free to do that uh, so the folks can see um, who is in the room. We'll be doing some global understanding of who's in the room via these polling slides. But if folks want to introduce themselves via the chat, uh, feel free. Uh, which, with that, Joffrey, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Brad. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining today. Um, as you see on the screen, or you should be able to see on the screen, if you can go to navigate to menti.com and enter that eight-digit code, I'll allow a little bit uh, more time for that. And we have four pretty straightforward questions here. Um, and I just opened voting. So the... Um, I think we will get that in the chat, that code. Go ahead and answer based on what best describes your title or role, staff planner, community development director, or planning director, economic development manager, or other. All right, so we're certainly a little curious what the other um, group is comprised of. We do we do know we have a, a mix of, of folks that probably categorize as others, a lot of staff planners. Um, another, let's see. Hmm. 
another uh, 15 seconds or so. It's kind of leveling out. Okay, I'm gonna navigate to the next one. If you are representing a jurisdiction, what size is your community? Uh, their buckets are there, 25,000, 50,000, 50 to 100, 100 to 250, and then greater than that. All right. So far, close to half are uh, under 50,000. Over half are, pardon me. And hit that 30 number pretty quick. Saw 30 voting participants in the last one, so I'm waiting for a couple of more. But uh, certainly that may be it, actually. Nine. Okay, five more seconds. All right, and moving on to the next question. Does your jurisdiction currently have an inclusionary housing ordinance in place? Um, this is a similar question that went out as part of a survey in late April. And so uh, a number of you may have responded to that. So we wanna see those results again here. Okay, overwhelmingly no is the answer. It is okay if you're not sure. All right, we're getting close to that 30 number. And five, four, three, two, one. All right, I think this is the final question here at the outset. Is your jurisdiction considering creating a new or modifying an existing inclusionary housing ordinance in the near future? Let's call that this year or next year. All right, so some promising results there with a lot of yeses. And certainly a lot of um, uncertainty there is, is uh, certainly um, fine and expected. Okay, we have one more to vote. Okay, and five, four, three, two, one. I'm gonna go ahead and close voting here. Uh, so some interesting results and um, all right, Ed, closing voting here. Thank you very much. Um, I am going to, um, we are going to have, Heidi Agler will be our first speaker. She will be presenting on the basics of inclusionary housing or um, IH 101, inclusionary housing 101. And um, Heidi, you are, you have the, uh, the floor. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank, and welcome, everybody. Um, I am going to, hang on, let me swap this display so you all should be able to see my slide. I'm Heidi Agler from Root Policy, and I'm going to give you a little overview of inclusionary housing. Um, hey, as Heidi. Oh, yeah. You had it the correct way, and now we see it on the back end. So, okay. thank you. Wanted to let you know. It's not how it worked when I was trying it out. Does it work? <laughs> Can you that just. That looks keep... great now. Awesome. Yep. Thank you. Zoom keeps showing your toes. Um, so, I'm going to, I'm as, as Brad, uh, some of you joined a, a little bit after Brad uh, kicked us off, and, and I do want to reiterate I will use inclusionary housing and inclusionary zoning. Um, in the same form, um, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the nuances um, in some communities. One of the, when I was putting this presentation together, one of the things I was thinking hard about is why do we use the term inclusionary, which is really the operative word for me. And, you know, sadly, it's because zoning, um, many, many early zoning and first zoning ordinances were meant to be exclusionary. So a little bit about the context of inclusionary 
zoning in the context of, of zoning in general. Um, zoning powers really came to be. So there was some experimentation with zoning, um, some not so good, um, some really very exclusionary in the early 1900s. But the big case that sort of uh, made zoning legitimate was Euclid versus Amber Realty. This established zoning as a reasonable extension of a local government's police power, believe it or not. Um, and in that case, zoning was used to regulate the placement of what were called nuisance uses. And sadly, this included apartments. So um, this gives us a little bit of a flavor of why we really emphasize the word inclusionary when we think about types of development that incorporate both affordable and market rate units, it's because uh, zoning in the beginning of time was e exclusionary in nature. And a little bit about what that looked like from the perspective of Euclid. Um, this is right from the case and, and the highlights. I'm, I'll give credit to a local lawyer, Brian Connolly, um, who teaches um, uh, a land use and zoning. <clears throat> In the Euclid case, um, the rationale was that um, exclusionary zoning will increase the safety and security of home life, uh, preserve a more favorable environment in which to rear children, um, just, you know, flat out said apartments and people who live in apartments are parasites. You see a lot of this language, I wouldn't say quite as direct, but some of the coded language we hear today with opposition of development in general takes some of this form. So a fear that different types of land use and what we're, than what we are accustomed to um, may be nuisance uses. It's logical, I would argue, to worry about developments um, that are close to really heavy manufacturing, for example. And some of the early zoning was really trying to mitigate those conflicts and uses, but they did have the unfortunate, many, many uh, zoning ordinances had the unfortunate um, flip side of being exclusionary and, and zoning against different types of protected classes from living in a community. The history of inclusionary zoning, um, it, it originated actually a long time ago in Fairfax County, Virginia, Montgomery County, uh, Maryland. Those two counties have had very successful policies over time. Um, the latest and greatest count by Grounded Solutions that does a lot of policy work around inclusionary zoning was that 900 jurisdictions in 25 states have programs. Some states like California, Massachusetts, and New Jersey actually require local governments to have inclusionary housing policies. Others deny um, and or in the or in the active process of denying uh, local communities from adopting inclusionary zoning. Uh, Colorado partially uh, denied localities from adopting rental inclusionary zoning up until very recently. The way when I think about inclusionary zoning versus inclusionary housing, the way that we see this um, uh, implemented in many of our clients for many of our clients is inclusionary zoning is really zoning provisions that require a condition for development of a proportion of low and moderate income units. This can be mandatory or voluntary. Some communities will try out inclusionary zoning from a voluntary perspective and I will tell you that rarely produces units. So voluntary programs just don't work very well if your objective is to actually produce units. Inclusionary housing, I would say our clients use more broadly, and it can refer to inclusionary zoning, but other types of programs such as requirements or incentives. If you are thinking about doing inclusionary an inclusionary zoning uh, program, it's a really good idea to do a nexus analysis. Um, that's just looking at the relationship between that requirement and what's needed in a community. It's just a, a simply a good idea um, to avoid any type of legal challenge to show that relationship, um, that public benefit from such an ordinance. So the most common questions we get, um, and as Brad uh, indicated, we do housing market studies and strategic plans pretty much all over the country. When we're presenting in front of planning commissions and town councils, I wanted to address the questions that you all might get as you're thinking about implementing or considering inclusionary zoning ordinances. The first is, does inclusionary housing produce affordable units? And the answer is yes, in certain cases. So the ordinance must be structured to promote unit production. Um, and, and really the key here is the fee in lieu. It must be high enough to discourage developers from buying their way out. 
that would approximate the cost of the building, marketing, renting, and selling an affordable unit. Now some communities, and Seattle would be a case in point, they have a blended program that incentivizes production in some market areas, um, so some neighborhoods or sub-markets of the city, and it actually incentivizes payment in other markets. Um, the reason being that the, the city uh, intends to produce deeper levels of affordability in certain sub-markets, and they're partnering, they're generating a fee and partnering with nonprofit developers to achieve that. The other piece that is really key, and this is really important in small communities, the first thing that we typically look at is volume. So if there's a moderate to high volume of residential development occurring, when you think about the inclusionary requirements going to be a proportion of that volume, um, it's really important to test volume and ensure that if you're not producing a lot of units, a lot of market rate units, you're not going to produce a lot of um, affordable units through an inclusionary zoning policy. So we typically will look at volume first and foremost foremost when we're thinking about recommending a policy just to make sure that it's actually going to produce units. Um, if you don't have a high level of volume, it may be easier to achieve affordable housing through a low-income housing tax credit program, for example, setting aside land um, and then leveraging other public subsidies to produce units. And then last but not least, um, you need to do an economic feasibility test to make sure that your requirement is economically feasible. Otherwise, developers could you know, leave your market altogether. Other question that we get is, does inclusionary housing increase housing costs? Um, a very, very uh, legitimate concern. And the answer, uh, I don't have a good answer for this, but it's really, it depends. Um, you know, I would argue that housing costs have been increasing in cities with and without inclusionary housing programs. Why? We have a very, very low supply right now, high cost of materials, very high cost of labor, and an investor-driven market um, that, you know, with short-term rentals, in case in point, are taking some long-term rental units out of the supply chain. After implementation of programs, land costs and expected returns typically adjust, and I'll show some graphics about how that's happened in some uh, larger cities throughout the nation. And then the other you know, consideration is there will be cross subsidies. So very rarely will a developer say, I'll just do this out of the good of my heart, out of the develop, you know, reduce my profit um, or my investor's profit to produce affordable units. There needs to be some kind of a give. Typically that happens with some type of incentive that the public sector will offer that developer to offset the cost of those affordable units. But cross subsidies are really a very real solution as well. And typically those cross subsidies these are passed on to higher income households, um, and I would argue that most of the time that's a fairly modest cross-subsidy. So the pairing of public subsidies with a cross-subsidy generally does, if um, uh, the, the requirement is reasonable, generally doesn't harm the development community too much. When we look at housing production um, and how that has changed in two cities that have had um, some pretty robust inclusionary zoning policies recently, look at Seattle. Seattle adopted a policy and then changed that recently. What we typically see is a run-up in permits right before the policy is passed. Generally, there is a window that is made available, so a notification that the ordinance is going to take place at a certain point in time. It's definitely definitely in a developer's best interest to uh, submit there and try and get their development approved um, before that ordinance takes place. So in Seattle's case, you see kind of a heightened uh, level of permit activity, a little bit of a depression right after that policy was passed, and then um, it returns back to normal. On the Seattle's case, we have sort of a, we have a, a line there that shows, a trend line that generally shows how development bounces around and that it's a steady increase. So in Seattle's case, case the inclusionary zoning policy didn't really harm um, production too much. In San Jose's case, you see this move around quite a bit um, before and after. San Jose has a um, um, they're a little bit of a unique case in that they don't develop as much um, market rate as, as uh, Seattle. So you see you saw an evening out of that development prior to their policy being passed. 
I'm just going to end with key considerations in program design, and then I'll take questions for a few minutes. Uh, I've got three slides on these, and these are areas that I would advise you uh, to think about You know, when, when you're in the early stages of uh, considering or developing an inclusionary zoning policy. The first is what household or AMI, so area median, median income levels, should the program target. This should um, be tied to a housing needs analysis. So I would caution against coming up with an AMI level before you really understand where the need is in your community. And those AMI levels should be uh, different for renters and owners. Housing needs analysis should be able to accomplish that. If you're thinking about doing a needs analysis, I would pay special attention to the AMI AMI levels as part of that analysis. Should the units have the same finishings as market rate units? And this is really a policy call. We see some jurisdictions that um, don't require quite as high level of finishings um, in some development as market rate developments, and others that really want those finishings to be the same. So they don't want the affordable units to be different from the market rate units. If I allow some flexibility in finishings, I generally, that could be um, considered a, an incentive uh, or an offset uh, for a developer. Should the developments have the same unit size distribution? This would be based on the housing needs analysis as well as a policy call. That needs analysis should look at what's been developed by unit size, where there are gaps by um, an, an expected growth in households by uh, household size, to give you a sense of how much do you want to uh, require the unit sizes to be the same. Again, there's tremendous flexibility in how jurisdictions employ this. Um, I would just caution against, um, and, and pay spaying, paying special attention to this, you could get in a situation where you pass inclusionary just for a developments of a certain size. Those developments are multifamily developments. They tend to produce a lot of studio units, but your needs analysis shows a big need for families. Um, and so just make sure and be careful to ensure that your policies really match where need is. Should developers be allowed to develop, develop units on, off site? And should the program be structured to acquire a higher requirement um, of units in off site units? Again, this is mostly a policy call that can be informed by a housing needs analysis. Um, communities go both ways, and some allow flexibility for off site in special circumstances. So, um, my site is really constrained. Um, off site, in like Seattle's case, um, I, Seattle's case, has a, Seattle has a little bit of a different nuance, but as I mentioned earlier, they incentivize a uh, fee in lieu to produce just deeply affordable units in some of their neighborhoods. And you could achieve that through an off-site requirement as well. What proportion of units should be affordable? Um, this is this would be something that would be determined by an economic feasibility analysis. I can't emphasize this enough. It's really key to making sure that your program works, um, that you're not only hitting the needs, but also that your requirement is workable for the development community. So that's an analysis where you do um, hypothetical pro formas for different development types, and you look at you you pair that with your housing needs to understand understand what, what is a reasonable amount to ask of the development community in terms of incorporating affordable units into market rate developments. Uh, should the program allow flexibility in AMI levels and unit proportions? Should you give developers sort of a suite of options to choose from? And I think, again, this should be informed first and foremost by the economic feasibility analysis, but also it's part of a policy call as well. What should the affordability term be? So how long should we require those affordable units to be affordable? A bit of a policy call again, um, but I believe that alignment with other programs is really imperative here. We have some clients whose, um, whose affordability terms really vary depend on, depending on the funding source or um, the origination of the program, and that can get really confusing for the development community. Should developers be allowed to pay a fee in lieu of building units, and what should that fee be? Um, this is mostly a, a policy call and really determined by your desire to actually produce units or to generate funding to fund a trust fund and then have nonprofit public partners develop those affordable units. It also needs to be informed by the economic feasibility analysis, that fee parts, the magnitude of the fee. 
And then a few more key considerations. What incentives should be offered to offset the cost of the program? Um, developers, you know, when we do outreach to the development community, they are always quick to offer the types of incentives that will work best for um, their market conditions. And these really do vary depending on market, uh, vary depending on um, um, development costs. So I would be open-minded about those. The economic feasibility analysis can help inform that. Um, and then the new uh, bill that we have uh, that the governor signed a couple of weeks ago, 1117, provides guidance on the types of incentives that should be considered. How do we ensure that units are occupied by those who need those the most? This is an area, I think these last two are areas that are often overlooked in program design and are really, really critical to making sure the program works. Um, good program design and affirmative marketing. Um, some communities use community preference policies. We see this a lot in mountain areas. So there are preferences to local workforce in occupying those affordable units first and foremost before they're opened up to the broader uh, low and moderate income community. And how should the program be administered? Um, I would advise consulting with peer cities that have successful programs, understanding how much staffing it takes to administer their programs. Many communities will partner with the local housing authority because they're very good at qualifying people and, and managing those units. Um, so I would consider those partnerships first and foremost. You don't want to add layers of, of administration if you don't have to, but definitely don't leave that piece um, um, to the end. Think about that as you're designing your, and considering your program. And with that, um, I'll go ahead and take questions. Heidi, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, we are, as I noted in the chat, uh, we are going to handle questions for Heidi's presentation in Minty. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I do see someone has already um, added a question. Um, and yes, thank you very much, Heidi, for your excellent presentation on the overview and basics of inclusionary housing, some history, and then also uh, covering an, a number of key considerations um, to uh, set jurisdictions up for having a successful inclusionary housing program. Um, so go ahead and add your questions in here. Uh, we're gonna give a couple of minutes here. Uh, I think I'll start a one minute countdown in about a minute. Okay, um, Heidi, are there any are there any questions that you would like to entertain from this list? This is going to require you to read very quickly, but um, sure, I think I can get through most of them. I think I've got about five minutes. Um, um, uh, the first is considerations that would be more effective if we have moderate housing development. So the question is, what level of growth would be considered moderate? Um, you know, I don't have like a, a hard and fast definition, but I would, if, if you have a housing needs analysis that's done, for example, that shows that your need is, um, let's say 250, your gap is 250 uh, rental units. So uh, you've got in commuters who want to live in your community. I'm thinking of maybe um, a resort area or a smaller community where there's a lot of in commute traffic because there's not affordable housing within the community. Let's say you have 250 in commuters who say we'd love to live here, um, but you're only developing a uh, 100 units a year, uh, of rental units a year. If you had an inclusionary policy that required 10 or 15 percent to get to that 250 number, it would take you 25, you know, 20 to 25 years. So that's kind of the context that we look at. Um, um, if you're, and there's some communities that, that consider inclusionary or at least start to consider it and are permitting fewer than 100 units a year. Um, I just don't think that's a super effective policy. You can get more bang for your buck by going after um, a publicly subsidized nonprofit um, program or a land trust. So in terms of considered considering moderate, I mean, I would definitely say, you know, 500 units um, a year would produce 50 affordable potentially, and that's a pretty good number. So I don't really have a hard and fast definition. Um, it really depends on um, um, your context of the context of uh, permits in, in relative to need. 
In terms of what happens if a community starts with a voluntary approach that doesn't produce units, um, and do they scrap that all together or revisit what should happen? Uh, we had a case, we, we had a study um, outside of a community outside of Nashville that had a voluntary program and it had not been producing units. So in that case, we took a look at um, that, that, that community's ordinance and um, did an economic, well, in this case we didn't, but you should do an economic feasibility analysis paired with that to understand why isn't that voluntary program working and then how, if we made that mandatory, would that actually produce units um, or uh, would we have the same problem? So it's really a matter of figuring out um, in most voluntary programs, there are some incentives, but they're not meaningful incentives. So is it a matter of the incentives? Is it a matter of height? Uh, we've been doing some work in Tacoma, Washington, where they have a voluntary program, um, but they really can't get the level of scale to make that economically feasible, even in a voluntary program. So I would look at the reasons for why voluntary is not working, um, and then um, it, it may be because it's not mandatory, and just consider either incentives modification or a mandatory program. There's a couple questions about a nexus analysis. Um, the nexus analysis looks at, it, it builds upon a housing needs analysis. So a housing needs analysis is just looking more from the uh, residents or in commuters perspective, the number of, and types of units that are needed. Um, a nexus analysis looks a little bit deeper at um, the ability for, um, it kind of brings in that economic feasibility piece. So the linkage between the needs and employment employment growth and development. Um, in terms of, div, let's see, identifying latent demand for units, I'm not sure um, what that question is getting at, but I'll just touch on in terms of the of, of, of needs analyses and, and nexus analyses. Um, those typically will look at the gap between what the market is producing and what's needed, um, demand that exists and demand in the future that is typically um, related to employment growth, people aging in a community, and then just sort of the churn, household churn. So there's a number of different ways that you can look at demand. Um, I'll just touch on a couple others before. We're done here. Um, best practices are a community that re really got their policies right and that their programs are successful. You know, I will actually let um, Kathy Fedler from Longmont talk about her program because I think they have a, um, a, a very good program and they've worked around a lot of constraints that have existed in the state over time. Um, Seattle, uh, I believe, I think they've, they've got a very thoughtful program. Theirs is pretty early, so it's really hard to tell long term um, how many units they'll produce. And then looking to the East Coast, you know, Fairfax County and um, Montgomery County, they're really good best practices and case studies because they've had their programs for so long and they've experimented with a lot of different nuances. Um, they're not growing as quickly as our communities here, but I think that they're very, um, they're communities that you could draw a lot of lessons learned from. Um, and then, I mean, I'm just gonna, last question here, best practices. Uh, for production of units overall, they're not just affordable. One that attracts developers rather than presenting a bitter pill for them to figure out uh, how to swallow. You know, my response to that would be, um, I think we underappreciate um, in general the, the, the value of transparency. So, you know, we, we do have developers tell us that they would be more in favor of inclusionary zoning than, um, and this isn't, I'm certainly not, uh, this isn't just Colorado context. We hear this in a number of different communities. Uh, rather than having to go through a negotiated process um, or the risk of planning commission or city or town council rejecting their development proposal because it doesn't have the affordability that they expect um, is a really high cost um, a proposition. And so we're seeing a lot of developers in many, many different communities hedge against that risk and telling us that they would embrace inclusionary zoning if it was economically, if there was an economically feasible, feasible an economic feasibility study to support that rather than um, deal with the lack of transparency that they're, they're currently operating under. 
with that, Joffrey, I'll turn it back over to you um, to hear about some of the best practices uh, locally. Great, thank you very much, Heidi. Um, uh, quite incredible that you covered uh, most of those, answering most of those questions in just five or six minutes. Um, we will turn over uh, the next presenter will be Annalise Hope. She, is, she will present on Denver's experience with inclusionary housing, covering um, house, housing policy framework for the city and county. Um, and the, uh, their presentation will highlight the evolution of the city's inclusionary policies over the previous 20 years. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Annalise. Great, thank you so much. And um, really great, thoughtful questions. I'll try to maybe allude to any of those if there's appropriate content on my slide to the ones that maybe I didn't quite get to. Um, but really want to talk about um, more so where Denver has been, because I think just as critically as we look forward, it's really important that we look past to understand why did we get to the place that we did? What were the lessons learned along the way? And how can we constantly improve? Um, I think, you know, no community has gotten it exactly right the first time. And I think two different communities um, view success in different ways too. And so, um, you know, Boulder really prioritizes fee generation and they've been really successful in partnerships with Boulder Housing Partners. But if you ask other people, is Boulder's program successful? They, they might have a different response. So I think just thinking through even how does your community define success can be really helpful. Um, Heidi gave the context to kind of the national, how do these ordinances even come into play? Um, and she talked, alluded to some states that either explicitly require it or explicitly um, kind of ban it. D D Colorado is a little bit in the middle in the sense that um, in the early 1980s, there was a Colorado ban on rent control. And that was really intended to apply in, in the traditional sense of a rent control, like you might see um, in, in New York City. Um, in the early 2000s, there was what was commonly known as the Telluride decision, and essentially it found that um, inclusionary housing or zoning policies that applied to rental housing was deemed to be a form of rent control because you were artificially limiting those rents, um, and therefore, um, as Denver interpreted it, um, inclusionary policies could only apply to for sale housing. I do have that caveat in there because I think Longmont and other communities across the state have kind of circumvented some creative solutions to work around the Telluride decision over the past 20 or so years. That being said, we don't have to in the same way, thanks to the great work um, done at the state legislature um, with the passage of House Bill 1117, local government authority to promote affordable housing. I saw Brad put that in the link Happy to speak to it a little bit more, but we have the expert on the line. But essentially, as that passed, it really is opening up the door for what we can do with inclusionary policies on all new housing types. So in terms of kind of where Denver started thinking about inclusionary housing, it's been over 20 years. Um, and as we were starting to develop the inclusionary housing ordinance in um, 2001, um, and sorry, that should be um, not 2002, it should be to 2017. Um, but as we were developing that inclusionary housing ordinance, we did have kind of an interim tool where we were just site specific negotiating outcomes and we were building that into site specific land unit developments. Um, we still have some of those that are undeveloped and they're certainly challenging for us to figure out what to do with. Um, but we did have an inclusionary housing ordinance um, on the books from 2002 until 2016. Um, and that inclusionary housing ordinance, I'll speak to a little bit more, but um, focused on larger for sale developments. Um, at which point, though, we, we changed our approach in the city of Denver and moved towards a linkage fee. Um, so rather than assessing the impact on one segment of development being large scale for sale housing, the linkage fee applies across all development types and assesses a fee. Um, additionally, shortly right after that, we also implemented an incentive pilot program to try to encourage more mixed income housing units on site near the 38th and Blake station area. I'll speak to some of those outcomes there. Um, and kind of what we've been doing though, because I think um, council and the community and the city has acknowledged that our current programs are insufficient. What we've been doing is negotiating a lot of voluntary affordable housing agreements. Um, and those are really inconsistent and kind of lead to some inequities from both the neighbors that have the, the ability to advocate for those as well as the developers that are willing to participate. Um, and then currently um, we are leading um, the project known as expanding housing affordability to look at how we can create a more holistic system of um, mandatory program requirements, incentives and revisions to our linkage fee. 
So in terms of kind of, I'm gonna talk a little bit more detail about the inclusionary housing ordinance. It went through quite a few revisions over um, its you know, 15 year period. Um, it started out um, with some really standard requirements that, that limited flexibility, but then there was some industry pushback of it, it didn't offer the flexibility that we needed. So then it kind of tilted towards these more negotiated site specific outcomes, which did certainly allow for greater flexibility in, in Central Park and Gateway Green Valley Ranch and Lowry, but it really became burdensome from a staffing perspective. And so there's kind of this teetering um, effect that some communities might you know, veer more way towards another. Right now, Denver's certainly veering more sort, sort towards a standard requirement desire based off of current um, conversations with industry and community. In terms of its applicability and kind of where it was triggered, it was at for sale housing of 30 units or more. So it was a pretty high um, threshold of when that um, ordinance would apply. And in terms of its requirements, um, it required, um, it, it kind of bifurcated it into two different sections, um, high cost structures, which were really um, any structure four stories or more, and then standard structures, um, single unit all the way up to kind of three story walk ups. So those those um, affordability levels of AMI varied slightly, but both of them had a 10% requirement of total units. The um, you know earning the households was 50 to 95 in high costs and 50 to 80. But what we really saw though is that people were bringing in folks earning kind of on that top end, so the range really didn't produce a whole lot. And then in terms of, of affordability length, um, some of them were 15, but in the latest iteration, it was up to a 30-year affordability length. The program did, as many do, um, also provide alternative compliance. So your default requirement is you're going to build, um, you know, 10 units, say, on site of your 100 unit development. Um, but there were different alternative compliance to allow you to build, um, you know, additional units either at one or more sites or adjoining. But it did have to be within the same statistical neighborhood. So the Heidi's question about do you allow offsite? Um, we wanted to ensure that it still stayed within the same geographic area. Um, you could also do it within um, a portion of the light rail station, or you could um, contribute to the special revenue fund. Um, however, it was only 50% of the uh, price of the affordable unit not provided. Um, and so what that meant is that it was really easy to pay out, especially in our high cost areas. So that was certainly a lesson learned and kind of a gap in our alternatives compliance of um, it, it really made sense to pay out instead of build units in many of our higher cost areas. Additionally, um, the, the House Bill 1117 kind of sets up this expectation and our old IHO had this, but it provided either rebates or incentives if you were to develop those units on site. Um, it, it started at a $5,000 per unit incentive, or if it was a larger redevelopment, it could go up to $250. Um, thousand dollars. Um, and this was nice because it operated as a closed loop system. So it wasn't pulling funds and resources from other areas. Um, so um, projects that paid the fee in lieu would then go into this fund and then that fund would be used to pay the rebate for those building on site. Um, also, there were some density incentives and parking reductions, um, but they really didn't push the needle as they were really moderate um, in terms of the, the incentives offered. So in terms of outcomes to date, you know, we oftentimes look at total number of units as a metric of success because it's easy, but I, I will just note that I think it's important to look at your overall impact to the housing system um, and how that's operating. As, as Heidi alluded to, um, there are going to be some offsets to those market rate units, so ensuring that what you're asking is economically feasible and viable is really important. Um, but over the years, it did produce over 2,000 units and um, over $7.6 million from cash in lieu. As you can see, though, um, it was really productive prior to the, the Great Recession when we were developing out in um, Stapleton Central Park, Gateway Green Valley Ranch, and Lowry. Um, however, after the recession, kind of the early years, um, as we were coming out of it, the unit production was incredibly low, which led to, to further revisions and rethinking of of why you know Denver's starting to grow, but we aren't seeing any inclusionary um, construction defects also played a considerable role in this, in the sense that we just didn't see the condo development. In terms of kind of where I would say um, some of the shortcomings of, of the prior program were, um, is we certainly saw low production rates compared to overall city growth. We weren't capturing those impacts of city growth. And so we were seeing a substantial amount of new market rate rental coming online, but none of that was becoming affordable. Um, certainly the impacts of the Great Recession played a big role into that, as well as I mentioned, the construction defects. 
And the, the high threshold of applicability of, of 30 plus for sale units, that might be appropriate in more suburban communities that are doing more greenfield development. But given that Denver is fairly landlocked and we're primarily seeing um, infill projects, um, a lot of them are at a much smaller scale magnitude than, than 30 units, especially when it's a for sale product. Additionally, there was a significant number of foreclosures a lot of this, you know, was on par with what we saw happening across the city, um, you know, between 2007 and 2011. Um, but in, in the 2013-2014, we did make some revisions to the ordinance that, that, that set um, the homeowners up for success better than we did before, where we required homeownership counseling as a part of the program. We expanded income eligibility to the higher ends, and we also included more hardship exemptions that gave people the opportunity to rent their home in certain situations. So, um, you know, myself as a homeowner, if I um, need to, you know, if I get drafted for the military and need to go overseas or I have a, a job layoff, before we didn't have um, the ability for someone to rent out their home, either partially or fully. Um, so we really wanted to expand that to acknowledge that people might come into changes and need to be able to rent their home for a period of time to stay in it. Um, also, um, some of you maybe saw in 2018 the auditor report. Um, at the time, it was under our Office of Develop um, Economic Development. Um, but what I think is just really important to sort of note here is that, you know, just as much work as you put into figuring out what the ordinance is, just as much work needs to go into how the ordinance is tracked, administered over time, um, you know, ensuring that we're calculating the resale prices appropriately so they remain affordable, um, income eligibility being appropriately, um, you know, qualified. This is where partnering with the housing partner can be really great. Um, additionally, you know, there was just a lot of inaccuracies in data and compliance tracking. Luckily, you know, since the early 2000s to now, the data and the programs available to the city and communities um, are, are so much better than they've been before. But I think it's just a really stark reminder that, that big cities can get it wrong. And even if we have more staffing, we can still get it wrong. So we have to be really thoughtful about how we set up that enforcement and compliance, especially if we're talking about units that are going to be affordable for, you know, 60 years or more. Um, pivoting just a little bit to um, the, the linkage fee, so moving away from just assessing an impact on only for sale, we wanted to um, go towards um, fee generation that applied to all new development. As Heidi alluded to, we did do a nexus study, which is kind of getting us to what is that legally justified fee. It breaks it down by use type, so industrial had the lowest um, legally justified fee with standalone commercial at the highest end. We then conducted financial feasibility to really understand um, what is the amount of fee that development can withstand um, while still meeting standard feasibility metrics um, from both long-term and short-term investor perspectives? The current fee that we adopted, as you can see, is far more modest um, than, than what we could have adopted, and it's far more modest than many of our peer cities, um, which in part is why we are looking to revisit and restudy those fee opportunities. The other piece um, that occurred Shortly after the introduction of the linkage fee was the acknowledgement, though, that that um, value capture in some of our high cost growth areas was an important tool for us to explore. And so near the 38th and Blake Station area, which is kind of at the point of um, uh, Five Points and, and the Cole neighborhoods, um, this is a TOD area, but we did a plan update to establish kind of base and incentive heights to try to capture and in some ways circumvent the Telluride decision and um, to capture new development impacts and create an incentive system. Um, since that program has been in effect, um, we've seen a significant amount of development happening in the area. We have about half of the developments taking advantage of that incentive height um, and it's produced 95 affordable units. Um, however, you can see, um, you know, of the projects that took advantage of it, it's more than 1,800. So that's about a 5% affordability rate, which is really low when we compare ourselves to other peer cities. Um, so this was a, a really useful pilot project and a data point, but we know um, that we need to be more robust and better calibrate um, our requirements around incentives. So um, last two slides here, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. But I think just in terms of you know, lessons learned and what we're thinking about as we move in the forward is that the compliance is really critical. Um, I just, I can't stress it enough. If you are losing units that are no longer affordable, that's a missed opportunity um, and your program's not being successful. 
Um, additionally, for Denver, we have a lot of different sub-markets. Um, the, the cost of land and housing in our downtown central business district looks fairly different than um, out near the airport. And so having programs that are calibrated to sub-market costs um, is really effective. And um, I'll, I'll pick on Seattle again because they do this um, nicely as well. Um, our fee and loan needs to reflect the cost of developing those affordable units. Um, when you only had to pay 50% the cost of developing it, that made it a really easy um, out um, to paying the fee instead of getting those units in our high opportunity areas. Additionally, a variety of incentives are really necessary. And, and I would say that they're necessary for either a mandatory required program, but also um, if it's voluntary, then you're gonna be really relying on those incentives. So ensuring that they align with market demand and expectations and that they're meaningful um, is really important. Um, affordability longevity is key. Our citywide policy has now been updated to 60 years. Um, and in many instances, we're getting 99 years, but many of those units that were produced in the earlier IHO we do have expiring covenants, and so it becomes much more expensive for us to then re-extend covenants rather than just start with a long affordability period in the long piece in the first place. Um, and lastly, uh, and this is a really important piece as we're moving forward, clarity and predictability is necessary both for the, the development industry as well as the community residents in terms of understanding the impacts, expectations, um, and so forth. So, um, as we're looking you know, forward, we know that our housing needs in Denver are continuing to grow. We see our housing costs rising at two times the rate of wages um, and our low income um, communities of color are being displaced um, rapidly. We're seeing declines in those populations out of Denver, even though many of the jobs are still in Denver. Um, and also what we know is that our, our existing tools are leading to gaps in housing affordability. Public funds at the federal, state, and local level really prioritize housing serving um, those unhoused earning up to 60% area median income. And where the private market housing is providing new housing is really um, available only to those earning more than 120% AMI and on for sale it's even higher at 150%. Um, these data points are, are where we, we get them from a housing market analysis as Heidi alluded to. Um, and, and ultimately, um, my role as a regulatory planner is to implement our citywide plans. And if we set out a goal of being equitable, affordable, and having an inclusive city, then we need to have policies that actually ensure that happen. So we are leading the expanding housing affordability project. And so now we are studying <laughs> how do we do all of these tools better? What are the right incentives for affordable housing? How can we update our, our city's linkage fee? Um, to apply to new non-residential development and then look at um, inclusionary housing programs for both rental and for sale housing. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and see what questions we have. Annalise, thank you very much. Um, and I will be sharing my screen shortly with, um, we do have a few questions already for Annalise's uh, presentation. Thank you very much for walking us through an evolution of uh, Denver's inclusionary housing ordinances and, and programs that, that uh, the city has had and, and also identifying what has, where there has been some success and where there are, are um, areas to uh, investigate for further improvement. Um, Annalise, if you wanna go ahead and answer, uh, entertain any of the three questions yeah, and I so um, in terms of kind of I'll start with the easier ones, the two to three most successful incentives, I think um, the city, it's easy for us to give certain things away, maybe not politically, but it doesn't cost us money. And so that's reducing your parking standards or allowing a slightly greater density. Um, and those are certainly value add and we hear them from certain communities. But I would say when we speak to the, the development industry, um, all of this at the end of the money at the end of the day comes down to dollars and cents. And um, so for them, cash subsidy or park or um, fee reductions, um, tax abatement is one that comes up a lot, but is really limited due to kind of Colorado state um, taxation laws. Um, but cash subsidy, density, and parking are kind of the three that we're exploring because we hear the most interest in those, but cash subsidy being at the top. The other one that we commonly see in other communities. Um, is expedited review um, or circumventing a more public process, say not needing to go to your planning commission or your city council um, to have a public hearing, which per, in, you know introduces that unpredictability. Um, has going to the 60 year um, had any pushback? 
Um, when that policy was done um, a few years ago, um, the pushback came from kind of two folks. Um, one, it came from um, nonprofit organizers that were doing for sale housing, and they seem to have the idea that they want um, one or two families to be able to benefit from accessing those affordable units, meaning that um, maybe I'm the third family and the covenant restriction is expiring um, you know, next year. When I sell, now I'm gonna get a huge gap because it's gonna be coming from that affordable level to that market rate. And so that one family just got a huge wealth building opportunity. Some non nonprofit partners see that as a good opportunity. We as the city, um, our focus on for sale housing is ha helping as many families as possible still build wealth and equity through um, affordable housing projects, but um, that's done through kind of longer term affordability. I will say that the 60 year also too doesn't align with, um, um, not tax increment, um, LIHTC, um, low income housing tax credits. Um, those are at 40 years. So there was a little bit of pushback and kind of concern about, hey, if we need to reinvest in our property, um, will this be a, a challenge? But we ultimately got there. And I think we, we might even be looking at increasing that to 99 years um, or perpetual affordability. Um, to fees in lieu increasing each year, um, how, in, how frequently are we anticipating these? When we adopted the linkage fee, um, we said we wanted to provide some predictability. And so we won't reassess the fees um, until 2020, then COVID hit, so we're, we're coming around to it this year. Um, but annually though, we do adjust those fees based off of inflation um, CPU index. So it's usually a cent or two each year. Um, that being said though, um, we are reassessing those fees we are, by running new um, financial feasibility analysis that does take into account um, higher construction, you know, materials cost, um, higher labor cost, um, you know, and where the rents are and all those sorts of pieces. Um, that being said, once we do adopt a new fee structure though, we also don't wanna to have to be reassessing it every two to three years. So it's likely that we'll probably um, set an ordinance saying we won't reevaluate those fees other than moderate, you know, increases adjusted for inflation for another period of say three to five years. Um, getting to how we arrived at the $1.83 fee is something that um, I was not here for those discussions and I was just talking to others and, and they can't exactly remember, but it certainly started at a number and kind of got negotiated down um, and was looked at, at, at a couple of different factors. Um, and the, the 43 cents was um, for industrial, 183 is for commercial. So they're, they're different uses. Um, we certainly know that developers will be able to tolerate a much higher fee and still meet feasibility returns and metrics. Um, what kind of, oh, council's a good question. I'll maybe take one more and then um, we'll move along so we have time for Kathy. Um, you know, council in Denver um, has changed a lot in terms of their opinions and their expectations. Um, they want to be involved in a lot more site-specific negotiations and have their say. Um, that being said, we also know that it's our role to maintain predictability and consistency and, and ease of understanding. So we, we don't create a bottleneck um, in our development needs. So, um, you know, how we're managing expectations and staying focused on feasibility. I mean, we'll still have naysayers at the end of the process, um, but we are kind of bi-monthly meeting with our whole of council and really trying to spend a lot of time on educating council members to understand why financial feasibility adds value and is important. I think a lot of times the narrative that gets told is that developers just make a ton of money and they don't care about the city. And um, that's that. And, and there might be some of those, but ultimately I think we're trying to reframe it as the, the private development market is an opportunity for us to partner with them um, in a new way um, that allows us to leverage the developments that they're creating to further city um, housing needs and goals. Um, so it's it's certainly not easy. I would say, you know, the council that we had a couple of years ago looks very different than the council that we have today. Um, and so, you know, they're pushing hard on certain policies, but that's where um, setting those expectations up front with clear guiding principles that we want a market-based program that promotes clarity and predictability while achieving our equity goals is really important. Um, so if we have time at the end, I'm sure we can circle back to a few that I didn't get to, or I'll try to to respond in the chat, but I want to um, keep the program going. 
Great, well, Annalise, thank you very much for fielding so many questions and thank you for your excellent presentation. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen and, um, and give Kathy a chance to um, share her screen. Kathy Bedler will be uh, presenting on Longmont's experience with inclusionary housing programs. Uh, her presentation will highlight um, and compare two programs uh, with an overview of philosophy concepts, program options, and in incentives among others. So if you wanna go ahead and, I think that display settings drop down bar will allow you to uh, swap Okay, last, last time it gave it to me a very clearly. That and says, All right. So the, the middle, just to the right of that display settings, drop down menu. I am not seeing it. It's, let me go out and come back in again. So just to the right of that, where it says display settings, there's a drop down menu there. Um, it's hidden for you, of course, but um, or to the left of end slideshow. Okay, I'm not getting that at all. Hold on. Sorry, sorry, sorry. This worked good during the trial. Gosh, I keep getting the same. Perfect. Oh, that one was good? That one was good. Okay, sorry. That was this one. Okay, so you're seeing just this thing? Yeah, we're seeing the back end. If you go to um, the top bar where it says show task bar, go to the right of that where it says display settings, and there's a drop down there. If you click on display settings, just half an inch to the right of that. See, mine shows the toolbar for the um, Zoom. All right, let me see if I can find that other one that I was just on, sorry. Or the icon in the lower right um, will near the um, Zoom in, Zoom out taskbar. If you go to the lower right, very far lower right of your screen, and then the icon that looks like a present, that one, perfect. So it's not showing it on yours. Good Lord. I can also run it on my screen if you would. Um, that might be a good idea. Okay, I'll go ahead. And it's do not that. working here. Okay, I'll go ahead and do that. Sorry. No, that's okay. Great. Okay. All right. So. Got it. So Longmont's program was somewhat unique in that um, while we made adjustments to um, our program, they weren't um, tweaks, although we did do tweaks for each individual program, but we actually stopped it um, after a certain period and then started a whole new different program. So next slide. So our initial um, program ran from 1995 to 2011. Um, and, but we only started receiving units in 2001 because there was a long lead time that was allowed um, before the requirement actually kicked in. Next slide. <clears throat> so for the initial program, the philosophy was centered on deconcentration of affordable housing. Oh, did you see that chat? That they're not seeing any slides? Yes, I, I haven't seen that. Um, I can try and stop share and share again. See, it wasn't just me.
Okay. Perhaps I'm running far too many programs on my machine. So I might be able to pull up the PDF. Do you want me to try that? Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. Is that working for folks? Yes. Um, I still have a message saying that um, you, Joffrey, are sharing your screen. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to, um, I may end up logging out of Zoom here. My, my computer is technical difficulties. Are we seeing, are we seeing? That uh, works, yep. Great, thanks. Okay, so the, the philosophy of the initial program in Longmont was to deconcentrate affordable housing um, by having it um, within new developments um, and having an equity with the market rate housing. So the program required the units, the affordable units to be provided by phase and by type. Um, and the program was interested in getting units. Um, we did do uh, a deed restriction as well as a $10 deed of trust on each property to protect the affordability, the long term. Um, with by phase and by type, 10% of each type of home constructed um, had to be uh, included and 10% within each phase of construction. So if they have multiple filings, they couldn't concentrate it all in one filing. And the exteriors had to be the same. Interior finishes could be um, less, like carpet instead of tile or laminate instead of solid surface counters. Um, but if market units had full basements, then the affordable units had to have full, for full basement, sorry. Um, it did, um, for sale homes had a 10-year period of affordability, but with each resale of that um, unit, it reset to start another 10-year period of affordability. So we never actually lost any of the homes because of that. Um, and for rent homes had to have a minimum 20-year period of affordability. And this particular program applied to um, all developments of five or more homes. So within program A, the general alternatives are the same, build on site, build off-site within the same quadrant of the city. Um, they could purchase existing market rate homes and convert that to affordable. They could partner with nonprofits to build the homes on-site or off-site, again, within the same quadrant of the city. Um, and if they did partner with a nonprofit, it lowered the required percentage of affordable housing. <clears throat> they could donate land um, or discount count the sale of land to nonprofit, or they can make a payment in lieu. Our payment in lieu at this in this particular program was set at replacement value and um, totaled about 111,000 per um, single family for sale home and about 62,000, I believe it was for rental units and condos. We did not have a lot of rental construction in general um, during the time period that this program was in effect. So we did use the, the fee in lieu to, um, to construct rental housing with our nonprofit partners. Um, some of the incentives to offset the costs of um, the inclusionary housing program included fee waivers. And we also added um, paying uh, with our affordable housing fund, a percentage of the water sewer system development fees when they were doing more than the minimum 10% requirement, um, which was a, a real added bonus um, and very um, highly sought after incentive offered parking reductions, development code reductions. And at this time we did offer expedited um, development review. So that was also a, um, a pretty hearty incentive. In this particular program, we received, we received about 174 for sale homes um, and about 625 total for rent homes. Most of those were provided um, through the city partnering um, to construct that with using our, our fee and lieu that we got into the affordable housing program. <clears throat> um, 
We gained, uh, there was a gain to the community of 77 affordable homes above the straight 10% we would have gotten if everybody would have provided their units on site. And again, more rental homes, so we reached lower incomes um, by doing that. We received about 4.4 million um, in fee and lieu, and the affordable homes were scattered within the developing areas of the city. So when you look at a map of the city, it was very deconcentrated um, affordable housing. Um, with the repeal of the um, first uh, affordable housing or inclusionary housing program in 2011, um, we moved to providing an incentive only program. Um, when they were providing at least 10% affordable, we got a density bonus of 20%, a height bonus of one to two stories, reduced development standards for open space, set aside setbacks and parking, the fee waiver and fee offset program, um, expedited plan review, et cetera. And all of those could be administratively approved. So council didn't have to approve it. Planning commission didn't have to approve it. Um, unfortunately, no units were provided under the incentive only program, which kind of highlights what Heidi had said earlier. So the current inclusionary housing program um, with a new council is looking at really um, seeing what the fee in lieu under the previous program. Actually, we received more units that got to some of the goals that we had around rental housing and lower income um, assistance. So fee and lieu gets us more units is the current philosophy. Um, flexibility to address community needs and incentivizing middle tier housing um, was the goals of, of the current um, council. Unique to this program as we, um, we actually spent two years, 2017 and 2018, discussing the program um, before we actually um, had it well-defined. Um, we had a lot of community and developer input into this program. Council basically said, we're going to do this with or without you. We appreciate your input, so you might want to speak up here as we have um, different um, sessions where we took public input. And we did hear from builders, developers, realtors, the chamber, um, our downtown development authority, um, Longmont Economic Development Partnership, and several of our different uh, community advisory boards advocates for homeless um, uh, people experiencing homelessness and uh, affordable housing advocates as well. A lot of that feedback was incorporated into the program, um, but council also had their own ideas as well, um, which is um, kind of built out with the philosophy. So the current re program requires 12% of all newly constructed housing to be affordable. The AMIs are the same. It's now permanently affordable. Um, for both types of housing, although rental housing can buy out after 30 years, um, <clears throat> but it's somewhat of a disincentive to do that. <laughs> um, and it does apply to all development of one or more homes, but it does not apply to ADUs. Um, any affordable, any type of housing can offset the affordable requirement. So 12% can be rental homes, even though it's within a for sale community, <clears throat> for sale townhomes could cover a single family detached development. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and the reason it's permanently affordable is that um, that is a Boulder County wide goal. Every government in Boulder County has adopted uh, a goal to have 12% of all housing be permanently affordable um, by 2035. So that is how we got to permanent and, and the 12%. <clears throat> Same um, options available um, within the current program. You can build on site, off site. Although instead of being within the same quadrant of the city, now it has to be outside areas of low and moderate income concentration as defined by HUD. <clears throat> um, you can purchase um, existing market rate homes and convert to affordable. You can partner with a nonprofit to build homes. Again, the same caveat. And you can lower the percentage required um, by partnering with a nonprofit. You can donate land to the city. That's a little bit different before it could go directly to a nonprofit. <clears throat> um, or if it went go, if you would prefer to uh, donate to a nonprofit, council has to approve that. You can make the fee in lieu to the affordable housing fund. And then we have a clause we call let's make a deal where innovative solutions will be um, considered by council. Um, and you can also under this program sell credits <clears throat> if you build more than the 12% required. 
<clears throat> um, the fee in lieu is set at a per square footage rate. Um, so it applies to the entire development if you choose to do that, because um, we've discounted it to the 12% already. Um, it will get recalculated every three years, um, and count, but council can choose to accept that um, recalculation or not. Um, prior to the House bill um, passing recently, um, we required rental projects to go to council to volunteer um, to build affordable rental homes um, and enter into voluntary um, alternative agreements. We don't think we're going to have to do that now after the passage of, of the House bill. So, um, so that um, we'll be changing that up a little bit. <clears throat> so under the let's make a deal, um, these are innovative options um, for council to consider. So it's um, required to go to council if you want to do a combination of the options that were on the previous page. <clears throat> for instance, doing some offsite and paying some fee in lieu, et cetera. <clears throat> They must result in having more affordable housing or providing a greater um, benefit to the city. So two of the deals we've considered so far <clears throat> is with a large 470 home development. They're going to provide 28, 26 tiny homes, which will be transition, trans, excuse me, transitional housing for homeless veterans, um, plus providing eight um, homes with habitat um, for for sale, affordable at 60% AMI. So those two together equal 8% of the development, plus they're paying fee in lieu for the non-covered homes. So we considered 8% of the um, uh, um, 470 homes to be covered, um, and then <clears throat> the rest would be paying fee in lieu. Um, the other deal was donation of land directly to Habitat. Habitat is still gonna provide 12% of the affordable housing um, on site at this particular development. Some of the incentives to offset costs are fee waivers and offsets, height bonus of at least one additional um, story, <coughs> a density bonus, rental projects um, can get up to, so the inclusionary housing is only calculated on the homes up to the 20 dwelling units per acre. So everything above 20 dwelling units per acre in rental properties is exempt from the uh, inclusionary housing calculation. Um, development code reductions are allowed. We got rid of expedited development review. Developers are not happy, but um, we just can't handle it with all the developments going on in the city. Um, so that is more of a saving our planning people <laughs> kind of thing. We also added offsetting the cost of raw water deficits um, if you do 25% or more affordable. <clears throat> and then development fees and the fee in lieu can be paid at the um, at certificate of occupancy instead of at building permit. The middle tier incentive is um, for for sale homes that are affordable between 81 and 120% of AMI. And what we do is if you're building um, in the 81 to 100%, you won't have any uh, inclusionary housing requirement, no 12% units. 101 to 110, only 40% of the 12% is required and 111 to 120, 80% um, of the 12% um, is required. We have three projects that have signed agreements to provide middle tier housing so far. So outcomes of the current program, <clears throat> we've gotten zero for sale homes so far. And don't forget that this started in 2019, early 2019. Um, we do have 24 in the pipeline. For rent homes, we've gotten 10. We've got 106 others in, or one ten have gotten 10, 106 are under construction, another 290 in the pipeline right now. We've only received 20,000 on fee and lieu to date, but we've got 4.5 million estimated in the pipeline. And on the middle tier, um, we have received uh, 71 are in process. Um, and that shows the AMI breakdown. Um, most of the rental properties are providing units on site. Um, the majority of the for sale developments are providing um, fee and lieu or middle tier. And that's what I've got at this point in time. Great, thank you very much, um, Kathy, uh, for your presentation in comparison of the two programs. I will go ahead and um, share my screen here. Uh, if you do have any questions for Kathy, we'll take a few minutes. Um, and um, I do wanna, uh, Brad, uh, does have a, a 10 minutes or so of um, 
to cover next steps uh, for the next uh, sessions two through five of the um, of the inclusionary housing ordinance uh, cohort. So. Sorry. And Brad, um, sorry, I'm checking your. John, I just had a, a few yeah. thoughts on next steps in the chat for folks that have to drop right at noon. So that, that'll give them a right, sense. Right, thanks. I, I was on my chat, thanks. Um, Kathy, do you want to go ahead and field that question? Did Longmont base their policy and program on another community? So for the current program, no. For the initial program, we looked at a lot of different communities, um, including uh, mostly um, Montgomery County, Maryland, and Fairfax County, um, Virginia, um, as well as some um, Boulder's program um, and some of the other ones, and just kind of pulled bits and pieces. Um, I guess it was really important, again, with the philosophy of the first program. Um, the second one, it's a little bit more straightforward, I guess, than a philosophy kind of a thing. So this one was really, the council really had a direction that they wanted to go having seen the last one and they took the input into consideration as well um, in designing this one. Um, yeah, we continue to hear from um, our, our stakeholders, particularly developers. We're getting feedbacks and um, council is starting to make some tweaks to the program. Um, we did a few um, minor changes so far with some things that came up during planning and development review process for some of the, the different developments that we hadn't anticipated. Um, so we are starting to tweak some of those. Um, we're going to have a larger discussion um, coming up yet this year on um, changes to the sales price um, formula, as well as if a developer does contract with a nonprofit or partner with a nonprofit to provide their affordable housing, should the city also be providing subsidies to the, um, the nonprofit additional um, that they would not necessarily have provided to the developer. So it, I think it's really at what level should the developer be ensuring that they support the provision of those affordable units and not just put it onto the, the nonprofit community who then comes to the city kind of a thing. So that's a broad discussion we'll be having and we'll be getting a lot of um, input um, from our stakeholders on, on those two questions. Are there any last minute, uh, last questions? <clears throat> If seeing none, I will close the voting, close the open ended responses and stop sharing. And um, Brad, did you have any closing comments? Would you like to have address the group with closing uh, yeah, comments and next steps? Yeah, thanks, Jarvis. I'll, I'll go real quick. We're right at uh, time. And, and if, if your virtual work is like my virtual work, noon is no longer an open time. It gets booked uh, all the times. So I know we'll probably lose folks uh, right right now. Um, so I did put in the chat a little bit of thoughts about what's happening next. Uh, as noted kind of a couple of times during today's uh, conversation, we as Dr. Cogstaff are reviewing this very much as sort of an introductory uh, session. Um, we actually have uh, uh, designs on moving forward with four additional uh, sessions. Uh, to cover other topics. Um, those, uh, those sessions were, were largely identified through uh, a survey that we uh, put out to our member governments in kind of the April timeframe. So in, in receipt of uh, that survey, uh, we use that to design kind of what it feels like a, a run of, of five uh, meetings like, might look like, including this one. Uh, so as I mentioned in the chat, really what's gonna happen next is we will just push out one last sort of survey or opportunity for folks to um, identify themselves or other folks on their team who might want to be involved in the, the longer run uh, version uh, of this conversation uh, via the, the work group that we've been mentioning. So just know that that's something that this group will see um, in the not too distant future. Um, when we do have that membership of the work group finalized, that's when we'll go through the process of scheduling meetings. Uh, so can't tell you exactly when they're going to be scheduled. We'll definitely be doing that in consultation with the folks that are going to join us uh, for the next four meetings. So uh, I'm happy to like let folks uh, sort of 
verbally sort of share anything that kind of comes to mind to you uh, in thinking uh, through this, feel free to raise your virtual hand or if you want to unmute uh, and mention something uh, after hearing today's presentation and our general plan for the series. If you've got thoughts that are important for us to hear uh, now, that would be great. Uh, in general, our goal is to obviously maximize the value for all participants, uh, not only today, but also for future meetings. Um, and this work group is going to be pretty focused on local government staff, um, but I would be curious if folks have ideas on sort of uh, other uh, stakeholders that Dr. Cog in particular uh, should be working with outside of this work group uh, on this topic. Those, those don't have to be questions you answer today, given we're uh, past time, but anyone should feel comfortable uh, reaching out to me with uh, thoughts on that. Um, so happy to maybe pause just a second uh, to see if anyone uh, has any thoughts they'd like to share with the whole group. And I see Elizabeth, has got her hand raised. Go for it. Hi. So it's sort of a question, I think, for the group to think about moving forward. Um, and I'm not sure I'm, I, I honestly don't know the answer to it, but the thought occurs to me that there's the potential for a hodgepodge of ordinances to be developed across the front range and around the state. And we run the risk of, I think, doing a couple things, um, potentially cre inadvertently creating even more competition among cities and jurisdictions um, where one neighbor has a better IHO than another. Um, and that inadvertently becomes a disincentive for one community to, to meet its housing goals. Um, and, and the hodgepodge also potentially um, makes it actually harder for the private sector to get it done here. The, the wide variety of land development standards uh, that exist in the metro region, I think already provides an added layer of challenge for the private sector who want to get development done in trying to meet all of our various and sundry specific different zoning standards. And I'm afraid we, we could inadvertently make their lives more, more challenging. So the, the real question becomes, is there value in this group talking about developing something like a standard IHO that could be used statewide that reduces that possibility for competition and makes it easier and more likely for the private sector to, to do affordable housing and to, to get it actually implemented on the ground. That's, that's my thought. And, and Heidi, I, I see you on my screen, so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. I will just mention to, I had the same question in my mind about what is the role for sort of regional collaboration on this, but I knew if I asked that question, it'd be very clearly it was coming from the sort of Dr. Cog perspective. <laughs> so Heidi, if you've got sort of just general thoughts on the question as posed, uh, it'd be great for you to share. Yeah, it's an excellent question. Um, it, I think at the bare minimum, there's a need to, you know, um, coordinate, compare, like understand, you know, differences without um, interfering with local control, right? So, but, and I'm not aware of, you know, sort of sadly, and I think unfortunately, regional approaches to, you um, uh, affordable housing in general are, are very weak, um, you know, across the U.S. Um, they're, they're typically typically take the form of, um, you know, some information sharing. You know, Kathy talked about the Boulder Valley's sort of joint goal that they developed and then giving the jurisdictions their, you know, the ability to figure out how to best meet that goal. It's a really excellent way of, um, you know, Kind of just facilitating collaboration but also being aware of the conflict that you might be creating by different policies that either incentivize or disincentivize different types of development so i'm a huge advocate for um you know going beyond just information sharing and really actually collaborating and figuring out where do policies potentially you know just create a lot of barriers to supply 
we've been doing some work in Chafee County and I presented um, some work that we've done there yesterday, so it is now public. Um, but we did a little bit of a cursory review looking at the jurisdictions there, their different treatment of missing middle housing, um, development process, height, um, density, you know, and even there, um, there's, there's quite a bit of differences. And so, if, you know, I think just at the bare, there, there's a number of different ways you could approach this, but I would argue that if you can figure out a way to coordinate, make sure that there's not conflict among policies, approaches, engage the development community, that would be ideal. Um, both you know, kind of for some type of adoption of inclusionary housing policy, but I would argue more broadly for thinking about um, moving toward a more collaborative approach in addressing housing needs. And I'll mention one thing from the, the Dr. Cog perspective. Um, as we've been thinking about this series of conversations, um, our focus has been on making sure that there is value returned uh, to our member governments. We've actually tried not to like think too much about our our role outside of convening. Like, well, what is the what is our takeaway as an organization? We thought we would let this play out for a little bit and then ask ourselves: Are we hearing things that suggest? a conversation uh, that should be held that is in addition to sort of the peer learning conversation that we're trying uh, to support. So in some ways we're, I don't, we're almost withholding judgment or letting, letting, letting us learn more um, by the conversation that we support uh, via the work group to figure out how and in what way Dr. Cog might could support uh, this work more broadly. So in some ways that's, that, that, that's, that's our approach is to not walk in with some preconceived notions about what we can do. Um, so with that, I know we're already eight minutes over, so I, I will just basically close this out so that folks can get on with their day. I, I know there are probably multiple folks like me who are eight minutes late for their noon meeting. Uh, so one final, final shout out uh, to our speakers. Thank you so much, Annalise, Heidi, and, and Kathy. Uh, thank you very much for the Dr. Cog team uh, that helped pull this together and, and support us today. Thank you for everyone. I think at some point I saw close to 50 uh, folks on the call. I know everyone has crazy hectic schedules. So I appreciate you spending 99 minutes uh, with us today. So just be on the lookout for uh, the survey that I mentioned that we will use to ultimately populate uh, a work group that will continue uh, this conversation. So with that, I'll just bid everyone adieu and tell everybody, hope everybody has a great uh, afternoon and can stay in the AC for as long as possible uh, the next few days. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.